help. So just um, indicate if you can't. So um, I guess one of the things to uh, acknowledge is that a lot of us have have been asked a lot of questions and have a lot of questions ourselves about care of uh, women requesting um, abortion in these difficult times. Um, uh, quite a lot of the questions I've been asked have, about, have been about MTOP. So I, I might list the kind of questions I've been asked and just share with you where my thinking is up to because I am not an expert on how to deliver abortion care in this circumstance. And I think we're all learning and thinking about problem solving and mitigating risk rather than there being an absolute answer to uh, the, the questions, you know? So um, I'll share with you the opinions that I've managed to garner and, and what I've read. But the kind of questions I've been asked is, uh, the first one, and um, we might address it first, is, uh, if a woman is in quarantine, can she access an MTOP? And how would she access a beta HCG and a um, ultrasound? And how would we manage her care? That's the first one. And the second one that I've been asked quite frequently is, what would should we do with someone who's part way through their treatment and then um, either develops a fever or uh, uh, has uh, a compatible illness that would mean that they would have to either go and get screened or go into self-isolation. So that's so the first one is starting people off on an MTOP. The second one is what happens if something happens during the process. And the third one is about uh, follow-up. Should there be some differences to follow-up? Are there things that we can do differently? And then the fourth question, which I want to sort of put out and then just say, uh, uh, be devil's advocate and say, I disagree with it, is are there any things that we can do shortcuts on? You know, are there things that we can speed up for patients? So um, uh, I'll just call that shortcuts. Is there anybody else wants to add another question before we go through those? So we'll do MTOP first, then we could do SDOP if you like. Patty, I just wanted to ask about it's Siobhan here. I just wanted Hi. to ask hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about follow up contraception and um, you yep. know, should we be placing IUDs in planons and, and I recognise none of us are in, uh, experts in this uh, time uh, and whether we should be scripting everybody with the pill just as a stop gap. Uh -huh. what I was yeah, so we'll get, should we get to that with question yep. number three, follow-up slash contraception? Yeah, yep. yeah, yep. yeah. Okay, uh, anybody and, else or? Yep, Ange? Yep, I just wonder if all your clinicians go, are off work, who are providers, what happens then? Mm. Is, there, is there a backup um, like option to call on a different clinician if you've done all the work up and your clinicians are the ones that go are off work. So do you mean like doing it as a telehealth? Yeah, I suppose, yes. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Any others? This is, we're getting quite a list, aren't we? Yeah, I'm um, wondering the about problem. the telehealth the telehealth as well as a as a possibility. Um, to... mm. Can I throw in another one? Um, if, right. they close, if they close the border of New South Wales and Victoria, what do we do <laughs> for the women who travel from Albury to Wodonga or further afield in New South? That's where we're potentially facing that at some point. Oh, can, oh. You, get, can you get a boat, Ange? Cheeky. Hopefully it would count as essential travel. <laughs> Down the river. <laughs> Do you reckon having a boat on the river? Yeah. So, hi, there's, there's Lisa Raz now. Looking hi, like everyone. Home. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, so, Lisa, um, the way that people are introducing each other, are uh, we're just putting a wee few words about ourselves onto the group chat. Okay. okay. I'll do that. Yeah. 
Um, so we're up to question number six. Any other questions specifically by M Top, and then we'll go through the list. Maybe I'll start with the list, shall I? Start at the top. Hello. Yep, hmm. right, Patty. Oh, okay, sorry, I thought everybody had gone dead. Yeah. So <laughs> the first the first set of questions are around what what to do for the woman who comes uh, uh, requesting an M top in this time. Um, A if she's asymptomatic or B if she's in quarantine. So um, I, I would have, I would have, let me just put out what my thoughts are and people can question it. If, if someone comes and they are asymptomatic and they're at low risk, would everybody be prepared to start talking about doing an MTOP? Any thoughts? I'd be happy. Yeah, we were talking today, um, that now that they've said any patient is eligible for telehealth with any doctor, any GP, with that MTOP is really well placed to be done yeah. in telehealth. So we're looking at converting all of ours to telehealth. Oh, that's really interesting. So how would you do that then? Well, well I mean, if, if try we, Catherine, see how you go. Yeah, is that better? Yeah, um, we haven't really looked into the logistics. It was just flagged this morning at our um, meeting that it really would be ideal suited. I mean, I've done quite a few telehealth appointments already just yeah, for yeah. routine GP stuff. And if they need scripts, we either fax and then post or they come in and pick it up or somebody else comes and picks it up if they're... Um, because just coming into a reception, picking up a script and walking out would place them at very low risk, I think, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. if they're not unwell themselves. Yeah. And if they're unwell yeah. themselves, then we've gotten, you know, well relatives to come pick them up. Yeah. And do you have... Uh, so I, I would agree that it would be very well placed for a telehealth model. Um, I apologise, there's some sort of uh, code blue going off in the background here. Um, and uh, if would we be doing a would we be suggesting that we do a screening about their risk before we we um, attempt you know before we agree to start them on an MTOP by telehealth? Risk and what should those screening questions be? What risk of what? Of had, were they in contact? You know, because we're talking oh, yeah. about the asymptomatic carriers, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that is a, is a useful screening tool on telehealth or do we just take it? And I'm a little bit inclined to just take it if the woman is, is um, wishing to do this and she's made her own assessment. Um, Kathy, haven't you gone f um, telehealth at family planning? Um, well, we've sort of done, not really, we've done a semi-telehealth thing in the last couple of days in that we've sort of got done the nurse consult over the phone and then the clients come in and been in another room and on a mobile phone we um, get the doctor to do the consent and give all the information. I mean, we meet them briefly to chat to them and, you know, if we have to take blood because they have to come in down to our pharmacy anyway. So it is sort of nice to meet them um, given that it's not an extra real problem for them to actually come in because the pharmacy is 200 metres down the road. So, um, so do you have a screening that you would do? Yeah, we just basically ask them, um, you know, <coughs> upper respiratory symptoms, um, contact with anyone with um, mm -hmm. uh, diagnosed with coronavirus um, and um, overseas travel. And then for, uh, for patient, anybody else want to chip in? But I was just sort of thinking then for patient journey, uh, ultrasound, and beta HCGs or are people thinking of doing it all as a one-stop shop or uh, requesting that people have got all those things before they come? So for us, we, we request that they have them done before they come or they can come and see us to get them ordered, but we will probably be doing that over the phone now. The issue would be if they're in self-isolation, although I don't know if we've jumped to that topic because then 
we've got that's the comment. second that was the second yeah. part but we can jump there now so it's less complicated if someone is just a well person just the way we've been doing it all along we do it the same as we've been doing it all along and some of us will be doing that as telehealth do people feel comfortable with that but there and and there isn't necessarily a screening test that's 99 percent helpful is there that we could say over the phone I think I think probably self-reported and I'm yeah yeah so then then the next question is um, someone who approaches one or other of our services who's actually either in isolation or quarantine and um, I think that was your question Kathy do you want to ask that the way you framed it previously although I can't remember exactly what I said about it but um, yeah, um, like like is the MTOP a better option or, or are they better waiting? And yeah, I think my memory of your question was, because yes. uh, I wrote it down, was uh, if a woman wants an MTOP and she's in quarantine, how would we best get her beta HCG and ultrasound organised? And I think my reply at the time was I would be, uh, and I think it's still the same, is I think we should be very conservative about that because if someone's in quarantine or self-isolated, we're actually giving them some tasks that are going to be extremely difficult to do. Yeah. And um, I was really interested to hear what other people thought about this, that um, they may or may not have had any, any indication of how pregnant they are, but to wait till they're out of quarantine or out of um, self-isolation and then... Um, you know, they may have to have an M to, uh, have to have a, a, a surgical abortion, but it's probably safer yeah. than asking someone to try and arrange a beta HCG and an ultrasound when they're actually in quarantine. Mm -hmm. And the other thought about it was, if you started them off, and then they need to seek help, are they yes. going to be turned away? You know, and <coughs> just again thinking about their journey. So. Um, so what are, what are other people's thoughts about that? Lisa, you've been doing a lot of modeling at the Austin. What do you think? Lisa, just um, unmute yourself. Thank you. And I think there's someone, if there's a couple of other people just while I'm um, chatting, who we can get some background noise. So if you, if you could mute yourself, that'd be appreciated and we'll hand over to Lisa. Look, I I haven't got what we're trying to pretty much move to a sort of mainly telehealth model, but we're just trying to still have a clinic open at the Austin, but get some things sensible. Like I'm the only one at the moment that'll do the ultrasound so that there's just one, that's us. That's not, you know, that doesn't affect you, but just limiting all that sort of stuff. Um, one thing that we're finding useful at the Mercy at the moment is even if someone's been a contact, you know, people's worries that if they've been a direct contact with someone or they have to get tested, that um, we're really using that thing that they've got, this virus takes longer than the flu. You know, you do not ex exhibit symptoms you, or you, they really don't think you're immediately at risk of passing it on to anyone else for a few days. You know, that there is a bit of scope at the very beginning that you'll get a test back before you... Um, anyway, that's probably not helpful at the moment, but sorry, Pad, I'm not really answering you. So I was just thinking like, what would your response be if you know you've done, someone said, look, this Mrs. Kafoops wants to come tomorrow and she's in quarantine yeah. or she wants to start an MTOP and she's in quarantine. Yeah, I think that's really tricky and I think you've got to wait and maybe yeah. either do an MTOP when she's not in quarantine or do a stop. I, I just think it's tricky because I think if she needs a, if she needs to have a surgical procedure or she bleeds heavily, I think it's too risky. And also... Uh, and you can just wait, you know, just try waiting. And also, how does she get an ultrasound? She'd have to say, I'm in quarantine to the ultrasound. Yeah, no, it's too hard and it's too stressed. It's too hard on the hospitals at the moment to be trying to do theatre on people who might be in that position. Yeah. And even though it's rare, you know, it's not, it's just a couple of percent of people that are going to run into trouble. Yeah. I'd wait and either they're doing a later MTOP or a stop. And that's why we've got to keep our stops going. Yeah. So, does... 
So how do you feel about that, Kathy? I think that sounds good. Very yeah, good yeah. Advice, yeah. Yeah. So I guess one of my my mantras that I'm just saying to everybody as things get more complicated, let's just make the solution as simple as possible. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in an ideal world that would have been perfect for you, but it's not ideal at the moment. So holding off and getting a scan when you can and we'll refer you to a surgical service is probably the best and I'm really aware that that's going to mean more centralizing of services that we'd actually pretty had done a really good job previously all of us of decentralizing yeah. <laughs> if people have to have a surgical so be it but if we can assure them that they're they won't be forgotten you know yeah um, yeah Patty, um, just, oh, just Patty just letting you know Siobhan has a question and then there's yeah. quite can you see the group chat Patty no, um, I can't because I've got I've got the I've got I can't see the group chat because I've kept the case history open so I can't keep everything open yep no um, worries if we we, we might go to Siobhan first, tell me. then I'll let you know what's on group chat and yeah. then um, open it up to some other people in their comments yeah. I, I was just gonna ask do you think there's a, a risk in when we put people off, and I, I completely understand putting people off, that we will get to a point where they can't access the service and they're forced in a way into the pregnancy. Because if we have a look at, you know, what's going to happen to all health services, will there be a time when stops are, stops are stopped? When, you know, someone ridiculous makes a decision that says that this is not an essential part of healthcare when um, you know there's lots of other stuff going on and other critical care do, do you see what I mean like I, I just I'd hate to put someone off who was in quarantine at eight weeks and then by the time they get out of quarantine or whatever we can't get them into um, any, or, or, or is that just these are the times uh, does anybody else want to respond? Feel free to unmute and to um, respond if you'd like at this point. Had just one thought from me is like we can be a bit, you know, a bit thoughtful about just the time. Like if it's this week, it's okay. Um, you know, well, can you, you just explain? Well, that I think things are going to change as the th situation is going to change quite dramatically. Um, but I think, you know, what we do this week, um, you know, we've got we've got a few weeks if we really think that the, sp the spike of this is going to hit in um, about 14 weeks. Um, we've got a little bit of time where we we might you might be able to to do something, but I still, I think I really do think that people who have an infection and we know they've got an infection should not be being treated in a way at the time that puts them at risk. And I, I think that is something that we should just do. And at the, at the Austin, we've had um, quite, I think we feel like we're trying to ramp up, make sure our actual surgical abortions can be ramped up. I just don't think we can, compromise on that one so you were saying if they've definitely got think, infection I'll, 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 do you mean if they've, if they've definitely got covid we wouldn't be doing it yeah yeah and we wouldn't be doing it surgically either yeah that's what i mean i think we yeah. can't we just yeah, have to do yeah. that from now yeah because you could you couldn't but what if what if they're just they're a contact their husband's got it they, you know, and they're in self-isolation. Then I think that's a different matter. I think some of those things can be judged differently. That's what I was trying to explain, but didn't oh. do so very well before. So I think, um, so I think where my thinking is, and, I, and I'm, I'm not the um, guru on this, that uh, again, it's this thing about it being a simple message. And if it's going to change weekly, that's going to be quite, hard for everybody to keep up with. I guess that's what I'm worried about, is like if, if we say, oh, well, you could get away with it this week, but in two weeks time, if someone's in isolation, you shouldn't, you know? I, I worry about that, but I'm just putting it out there. What do other people think? Um, Patty, there's a few comments from Rhonda from MSA and also um, Steph from Children by Choice. Yeah. 
and Lou. Just thinking, um, if you don't mind, I can. Um, yeah, can we have their opinion? Yeah, Rhonda, yeah. are you happy to contribute at this stage? Um, oh, here we How's go. That? Yeah, yes, that's great. Hi, um, so Rhonda from MSA. Um, so I, um, we're currently um, trying to look at some other alternative models um, and trying very hard to, I'm just gonna put myself on so you can see who I am. So we're trying very hard to um, think ahead and um, re uh, create some other models. So one of the things we've done with MTOP is um, moving to the telehealth. Um, we've also rolled out the um, low sensitive urine pregnancy for the um, PMAs, and that um, that's only just happened this week, and that seems to um, so hopefully we're, that's sort of reducing the face-to-face -face contact. With our um, we uh, when they are ringing in through the telehealth, the um, the telehealth people are screening them with questions about um, just we're using a matrix. Uh -huh. um, so with the matrix, do? we're looking at um, whether um, where they are, and then if they are. Um, if they're possibly um, not symptomatic or they're close, um, they've been in close contact, we're asking them to wait two weeks and then come back mm -hmm. in uh, and then re-contact um, re um, us then. So we're not taking the onus at the moment for, to, to contact them. That we're letting them um, do that. Re-contact you, yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing is we, um, unfortunately, uh, we're having to, um, because of the border issues, we're having to um, um, do um, stop our late termination or postpone them for the moment, which is really difficult because, like, obviously they're the most set time sensitive one, and obviously they are also um, people that are, um, you know, like it is, is essential travel. But it's just been so difficult to get um, clear information on the implication for clients that are coming from Western Australia in particular. Um, to access the service for that. So, um, and also about our health workers, if we, because we do have quite a bit of a, a flying play out sort of thing. Um, uh, the other thing we're just trying to reduce the amount of time um, with the, um, the late term, we are um, doing more pre admission stuff online. Um, that seems to, um, that's, that was what, got, what our aim was going to be, move into that kind of a model. Um, so that the two days that they actually come to us, they are the first day is the procedure, the feticide and um, the uh, uh, feticide, and the second day and, and cervical preparation. The second day is the um, rupture of membranes and um, re uh, evacuation of the uterus. So the gestational cutoff currently in Victoria is 24 weeks, and that's why we get people coming in from Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales. So. Um, I don't think our capacity will be reduced over time because we are trying very hard. Uh, the reduced cutoff, let's uh, reduce that. Um, so, sorry, there was just a question here, the reduced cutoff. Sorry, sorry, Rhonda. Um, you, I, would, I was just hearing that maybe you were reducing the gestational limit for later um, second trimester, is that correct? Um, I just saw a little fellow there too. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we're hoping, well with the MT, we're hoping to go, um, I think that there's um, some discussion about whether the MTOP can go up to 10 weeks. Um, so be, being able to use MTOP up, we're trying to, looking for permission to do that. Up to 10 weeks. Um, the station we do have is less than 16 um, for the stops. And then, uh, yeah, and then we're going into the um, the later case ones with this, um, multiple um, preparation as well. Um, is that does that answer your question? Sorry. Was there a couple of other comments? Because I'm just aware we're drifting off. Sure. M top just just to sort of and, and and no disrespect, Rhonda, but just to sort of so we just Absolutely. get a little bit of a summary on where we are with M tops. Were there another sure. couple of comments on M tops? Is that your comment? Did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Oh, only for those services that haven't regularly used um, telehealth for MTOP previously, apart from the DHHS self-screening test, which 
Louise has kindly shared as a test that is being used at Bendigo um, is to also consider screening for safety in telehealth consultations because sometimes we don't know if there's someone else in the room. Um, so just, I guess, you know, being mindful about mm. setting up what the safety parameters are before you have those conversations. Great. Uh, Lou, could you share with us what the DHS item is that you've shared with Stephanie or have you shared it with everyone? Oh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. Louise Holland here, Clinical Nurse Consultant at Vinegar Community Health Services. Hi, Katie. You're here with me today to our DP registrar. Um, so basically what at Benigo Community Health Services, we're looking at um, our primary practice and one of the um, documents that's available from the department is a, um, an online self-screening tool. And I just put it out there to the, um, to the group that if we were having a telephone conversation, then that um, self-assessment um, tool is available. Um, it is actually quite basic, but it also does... Um, provide the clinician with some um, important information in terms of um, um, advice and um, recommendations in terms of whether or not they're suitable for an MTOP or whether or not they would have to actually wait for a, um, a surgical examination. So sorry, is it is it the, the DHH recommendations are by MTOP or is it about COVID? No, no, no. So it's just basically the screening tool. There's not one it's just the um, generalist screening tool that everybody would have access to through the department's um, information that's been delivered on a daily basis. All oh, right. And there, there is just for other people, I was given uh, a very good GP tool called GP Cam. Are, are, has anybody used that as a resource for their patients? Because it's also got a really good way of self screening on it. It's, an, it's a, a website called GP Can. Any experience with that? Hi, hey, Patty, would you mind sharing that with the group at a later time? Uh, I can upload it, yeah, it's just, it's just GP Can. I Googled it and thought it was great, but yeah, I'll put the link on, yeah? We'll put it Thank in our minutes, Stephanie, okay? Yeah? Um, so, uh, so are we sort of thinking, and it sounded like Rhonda was also sort of thinking along these lines that um, uh, we would we would postpone the, the the quarantined patient and admit that that might well be a uh, a situation where they get beyond ten weeks or or more by the time that they're out of quarantine is is a general principle. Is that what people are feeling or comfortable about? It, it sounds like that might be another option, Patty, but I, I was just thinking that given the uh, MS2 step is licensed to go to 63 days or nine weeks, presumably there's a financial implication yes. if you go beyond. So, if you, uh, so I was talking to Philip today from MS as well, and, uh, uh, and that's quite right. They were thinking about going up to 10 weeks because you can but it's not on the PBS. So there is a financial uh, problem with that. Um, but I think your comment before was, well, you might get to the point where the patient can't have an MTOP. And I think we would have to try and look at referral pathways so that we would try and ensure that that patient is, it gets access to a timely S-stop, yeah? Um, and that would be where, as Lisa's saying, we're just really trying to keep the S-stop services going in the public domain as well so that there is more access and lisa and just brought up a very good point about um whether or not community ultrasound providers are going to continue providing a full service so what we've heard from our patients this week is it's getting harder to access one so if the gp writes if anyone who's referring writes to exclude an ectopic that's a time-honored technique for getting an ultrasound um, in, instead of writing viability considering mtop or viability considering abortion care so it's 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 a technique so it becomes more of an urgent ultrasound okay so they're still considered an essential service and will remain open even though there'll be problems with the um distancing social distancing 
Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the ASM has put out a, a series of, um, so ASM is the ultrasound group, um, and they've put out a, a series of um, recommendations about how they're going to run ultrasounds, you know, um, with more protective measures, one person only in the room, you know, quite a few things like that, possibly wearing masks. So it'll slow places down and they'll be more reluctant to to do non-urgent scans. And the other thing that our service is thinking about is doing more one-stop ultrasound and start the procedure, whether it's an M-top, which we usually do, or a S-top. So moving to more same-day services for both M-top and S-top and DNEs as well to try and help with that. Um, Gosh, you know, we've only we've only just started on the first question, and I'm aware of the time. So the second question was, what if a patient becomes unwell or develops a fever uh, when when they've already started the MTOP process? Do we have any thoughts about what our advice would be with regard to that? We can't stop it. So, um, uh, is there is there um, uh, there's always the chance that a fever is caused by misoprostol, you know, that, that's well recorded, but what should our response be to the patient who rings in and has developed a fever? Any thoughts or concerns about that? It, I think it's really tricky. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in the end, we're going to have to work out some way of managing because people who are in self-isolation or in quarantine or whatever are going to develop appendicitis. And yeah. so at some point we're going to just accept that people are going to present in the midst of one procedure and then query yeah. are going to be query COVID-19 and we're just going to have to have a way of managing them. Perhaps we should have had someone from the ambulance service here. Um, because um, I think there's not really any right answer to that, unfortunately. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we just have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis and take a history and decide whether to head down, have they got a respiratory cause of their fever yeah. or yeah. Yeah. A, a, a pelvic cause of their fever and, and make a best guess. And in the end, if they're not well, they go to ED and ED has to sort out the fact that you've got someone having an MTOP who may also have COVID-19, but that's going to happen if 60% of us get infected anyway. Yeah, it's going, it's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah. And so I guess we need to just be aware of the uh, importance of having something that we've given the patient that explains what process they're going through, you know, and the date. I mean, we've talked about these one, these uh, one page um, resource that CAF and I uh, uh, manipulated from the South Australian one. We just updated it for a Victorian one and we can give that to everybody again where the patient on one one side it tells the patient when to seek help if the MTOP is not going well and on the other side it tells uh, the practitioner what what to look out for so um, that could be really useful if they do go with a respiratory condition and they've also undergoing an MTOP um, so is everybody familiar with those because we can that that resource is online isn't it Kylie. Yes, it is, Patty, and we can certainly, if you if we want anything to be updated, we can um, prioritise putting it out to the um, to the network. Um, we're also thinking of prioritising putting out another newsletter with anything yeah. like that attached to it, so that yeah. we keep yeah. people up to date, yeah. and we can also put it on the resource hub. So we'd be quite happy to work with you to um, prioritise that. Yeah. So, uh, Sorry, it's Sharon Young here. I'm just new from Queensland. So all these resources you're talking about, um, that'd be really helpful if I could have access to them. Thanks so much. I'll follow up with you, Sharon. Thank you. Yeah. And hi, Sharon. We've spoken on the phone and I suspect I've sent you that, but we'll, we'll chase it up. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. Ciao. So just moving on then, is it okay if I move on, Kylie? Yes, sure, yeah. certainly, Patty. And look, you know, time, we might have to skip yeah. our case study today and just focus. Yeah, because yeah, this, this is important. Yeah. yeah. So Follow-up um, slash contraception. So um, Rhonda, I think, brought up the, um, the fact that the uh, low sensitivity urine pregnancy tests are out there and available. Um, 
And that is another possibility instead of getting the patient to come for a beta HCG. Rhonda, are you posting it out to the patient if you're doing telehealth or are you asking them to go and purchase it themselves? To you. Um, so what we're doing at the moment is um, we're, um, as of this week, we're sending it home with the patient. Um, yeah. And any of the ones in the last two weeks, we're actually sending, um, posting it out to them. So with um, sending it out with their instructions and um, and just following them up by phone. Um, and yeah, so it's just really reducing the risk of need to come back. Also saying, um, you know, um, the education on the website saying to, that it's not the same as a pregnancy test so that they don't. Yeah try and do that um, if they lose their test as well. So it's one thing that we needed to really make sure that they understand that part of it. Um, and then if, we, if they lose their test, they will be um, required to do the, the um, blood test. Yeah, yeah. And have you had much experience with them? Are you happy with them? Um, I mean, the experience from Britain's really good, I believe. Absolutely. And yeah. that's where we've based all this on and why um, it has been a, um, plan to be a model as well. Uh, Katrina Melville, who, who yeah. is Deputy Direct, she has um, extensive experience of the LSUP and there's really good evidence out there. And but she um, she's, does most of our um, telehealth stuff and very confident that um, that will follow us through quite well. So yes, yeah, so she's, um, yeah, I think that will work well for us. Now here's two dumb questions from me. Um, I don't know how much they cost, and could the patients buy them themselves? No, like they can't. They can't. We've got to distribute them, yeah? yeah? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And do you know how much they cost approximately? Because we could start ordering them here. Um, I don't know, actually, mm. offhand, but I could find out and get back. Oh, well, we can, find, we can also find out. I just thought somebody might know. I don't know why I've got $25 in my head, but I have. <laughs> um, uh, that might have been what the guy told me at the conference. Uh, anybody else know? Um, I, well, I, sorry, I, only to say that um, it, the information's been hard to find because I think yeah. the product's only just been released very recently in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And so I haven't found it either. Um, I, I emailed Peter this morning um, and he said that um, due to TGA restrictions, we need to sign off on anything that goes to market. We've just done this with MS, Murray Stokes. Not 100% sure what he means by that. Oh, it means he's released it to Mari Stopes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll, wa we'll, we'll watch you carefully, Rhonda, and look forward to hearing how it goes, because it looks like we're not going to be able to access it at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sorry, Patty, I, I, think, I think he sort of implied that, that he could, but they just have to do some special release, like he might release it to family planning or someone else, but you won't be able to generally get it. I see. Yeah. Well, well, we'll follow up on that and see if we can get it because it would be quite a, it would be quite an advantage, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so then somebody had the clever idea about contraception, just putting everybody on the pill instead of them having to come back. Uh, I can't remember who said that. Um, is that something that you're practicing already or are you, are we thinking that because I, I thought I had another thought about um, you know we know that we can put Implanon in on the day. Um, yeah, I, I it was me, Patty Siobhan. Oh yeah, hi Siobhan. Um, I, I actually haven't been at a clinic for two weeks, so I'm sort of a bit behind the eight ball. But I've I've done a lot of thinking because I've been at home alone. <laughs> um, the um, I guess the reality is that. Um, in our clinic, we don't actually, unless the patient walks in, with, which we've had once, where they were supposed to get the implant on in, did get the implant on in, pregnant. So that's when we were able to put the implant on in on the same <laughs> day as the MTOP. But we haven't been able to get um, patients to go and get the MTOP and come I mean, get the implant on and come back and have it in on that day. Um, so that, and we haven't stored implanons so if we could you know mm. if that was one change where we could actually store them and I have started talking to the um, woman at the pharmacy about a month ago but I think you know I may have missed the boat there there's a lot of other stuff going on for pharmacies um, and so 
I was thinking maybe as an alternative that um, we'll suggest to script as many people for the pill in light of the fact that even if we had arranged to do something else, we may not be able to get them to come back because something could happen to them in the meantime, as in they then go into an increased risk group or something like that. So mm -hmm. I was just kind of putting it out there, wondering whether anybody had thought of, you know, going back to the old ways. We've been banging on about larks for the last um, 10 years and now I'm eating humble pie, I suppose. Mm. Anybody and else want to comment? Well, so, that was mind blowing, wasn't it? No, I was just going to ask Lisa Raz. So, Lisa, at the moment you um, uh, see the patients and do an ultrasound scan uh, at follow up, correct? Yep. yep. So, could you? So, I'm just weighing up in my head. Is that tech? You know, I know we're not we're not wanting to get people back when they don't have to, and maybe you could move to beta. But if you were doing a scan and the uterus was empty, you could actually give them their lark that day. Yes, which is what we do now. Yeah, um, and so is that is that a better treatment than them coming back two weeks later into the curve um, if you did it with a beta? Uh, yeah, but we don't we don't have access to an ultrasound, so that, that wouldn't work for us. And it would work yeah. for others, but it wouldn't work for us. So. And Pad, um, just in response to that, the struggle we're having at the moment is that Austin has just told us we have to really, you know, thin down our clinics and go to telemedicine. So our meeting on Monday was more that us two had to. Yeah, so you're not going to be given the option. So it's getting more simple. You're not going to be able to do that. Getting simpler, yeah. yeah. But, but I think if... If there becomes a community problem with ultrasounds, like everyone can't get ultrasounds, I reckon we'll fight for an expansion of MTOP, say at the repat. I think we'll work out a way to try and change that if there's a community problem. Mm. But at the moment, the Austin's asking us to, you know, so we're looking at everyone going on the pill the day after they've, you know, had their... Um, yeah. Had, had their what, sorry, had passed their, their product? Sorry, you know, obvious, you know, had their eyes out past, pretty much past the yeah, product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, th I think that's, that's, it's not humble pie, Siobhan, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not a bad drug. <laughs> Moving with the times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just got to go with the time. Anybody else want to have a comment? Just, uh, Patty, I just wanted to, well, I was just thinking about the, issue of access to ultrasound and yeah. just wondering if um, there's any experience from other jurisdictions around the world given we're a little bit, um, you know, the, the time frame that COVID-19 is hitting us is a little yeah. bit behind, say, yeah. Europe and parts Beautiful. of Asia so that, and so on. That segues I don't know, because it, it's... Yeah. That segues nicely, Kath, into the next question, which was, can we take shortcuts? So I actually had several inquiries to, to date from the NHS practitioners and a couple of Canadians um, asking if uh, we had any experience with our rural decentralization of cutting out the ultrasound, because they're thinking about cutting out the ultrasound. Um, if uh, they if if they're not operating with a one stop shop where they're like in the NHS, there are some places where the midwives are doing the ultrasound and then starting the MTOPS, but there are other places where um, the the health board has outsourced the ultrasounds. So, um, and I was talking to several other people about this today, talking to Philip at Mari Stopes about this. Um, Look, I would be really, un I'm personally really uncomfortable about us starting to cut corners um, with, a, with a system for MTOP where the TGA said we've got to be certain that we know it's intrauterine and we're not, if we're doing telehealth, we're not examining. You know, I know that that, that examining a patient is, has got its flaws, but, you know, there, there, there are problems with us not doing an ultrasound. So, um that's what, what other countries are saying that they, they, they are coming up against is not being able to get the ultrasounds. 
So if that, I agree with Lisa, if we're coming up against, if in like four weeks time, we're finding there's a real community problem with ultrasound, maybe that's one of the things that might have to change in our services that we run our service with more people who can scan and we have two scanning rooms instead of one. Patty, um, I have some, pay, um, some doctors in our clinic asking if Medico legally, our insurance covers us for telehealth appointments as GPs. And I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't presume so. But you're obviously making a diagnosis and a management plan without examining the patient. Yeah. So that you'd be concerned about going through with an MTOP without an ultrasound. So cutting yeah. a having something go wrong and then the insurance saying, well, you didn't follow the strategy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, I think particularly, I really, really feel that we need to be very protective of those who don't have as, has, have as many recourses to investigations as somebody like me sitting in a hospital, you know, um, you're really at more risk for that, you know? So um, I, I think, um, I think I would be saying to, uh, to GPs that they that they would be wanting to have an ultrasound. Does, does anyone, sorry, Patty, has anyone seen the um, RCOG guidelines that they put out for performing um, MTOPs in the coronavirus time? Um, no, but they've sort of suggested a model where there's no ultrasound, no beta yeah. HCG, no RH, and um, they just do a fault. You, you know, there's caveats in yeah. it as well. Um, and they just do a follow-up uh, low sensitivity urine pregnancy test. But that's, in, that's under a different, like our TGA is slightly different than... But I mean, I don't think the working. TGA is completely clear that you have to have an ultrasound. I think No, it doesn't say you have to have an ultrasound, yeah. but you have to be certain yeah. that, that it's intrauterine. Yeah. But I, I, I spoke, like, I'm not talking about now, but I suppose further down the track, if it becomes yeah. difficulty, difficult, you, you know, it might be a clinical certainty. I, I don't know. It's just something to think about. Yeah, I think, I think that the group that have done this work are the Austrians, aren't they? You know, Christian Fiala, et cetera, have done some really good work on um, very early medical abortion without ultrasound with and without ultrasound where they've got really low beta hcgs so does the i haven't actually looked at the rcog guideline i meant to today because of these queries that i got yeah. today but does yeah. it mention a beta hcg so it don't don't do anything they're, they're right? basically saying that you could do do a, i've only looked at the summary i haven't yeah. looked at it in detail at all but yeah they're basically saying that you could do it without any pre-investigations if you you know if you had a good history there weren't any indications that it was neck topic from past history or, or risk or, or whatever so basically moving to a completely low resource setting right. model yep. of care yep. yeah mm -hmm. yeah Very interesting, all of this discussion, and I, I'm thinking so much about uh, access to services in rural areas and the mm. reticence that we're probably going to come up against now by our service providers who are feeling like this is going to be something that they will want to pass on to our centralised services. Yeah, um, yeah or, or this is an, a nice excuse to not develop the clinic that they were just about to develop. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Is this a good time, Patty, to bring in Carolyn to talk about the context uh, that she is obviously on top of <laughs> or aware of in relation to the um, 1-800-MY-OPTIONS website? And Yeah, yeah, sure. Does anybody provider? else want to... Uh, I just wanted to quickly say, and it was Angie's question, what do we do if clinicians oh, sorry, are, are go off? and you've already worked up a woman, look, I would suggest that you contact uh, one, of, one of us uh, and we could do some sort of um, uh, telehealth with you. I certainly would be prepared to do that. Kath and I would be prepared to be a central repository, wouldn't we, Kath? So we could organise that. But, you know, in a way, that's what we've done with some of the remote places that have lost, um, lost their prescriber to maternity leave or something like that. So is that what you're thinking? And somebody goes off sick and they were going to do an MTOP the next day? Is that what you're, is in your mind? And you, you had the person all worked up? Yes, something like that, Patty. Just yeah. as a backup, if, yeah. Um, I mean, at the moment, we're pretty fortunate. We have quite a few providers, but... Yeah. 
we just had an incident on Monday where our provider was sick and they're off for the week and we had no one. So yeah. just highlight, it was like, ooh, okay, what? Yeah, so that would be very helpful, I think, for our yeah. clinicians having backup. So, Kath, do you very quickly want to say how people who could get hold of us and we could, we could prioritise this? Sure. Um, it's good to send me an email just to say that there is a referral coming through, um, but you would just send a referral to the abortion and contraception service in the usual way. But um, if you're thinking about doing that, to, it's a big good idea to talk because there's a few resources that is a little bit that we've developed as a telehealth model that is not at this stage anyway hasn't been generally available. Um, to the abortion and contraception service. So we can just help anyone set up. But so send me an email. So how does she send an email, Kath, or does she call us? If somebody, they were all ready to go and her clinician has has gone off sick or self-isolation. So this this is where we, oh, sorry. Kath, you, you need to unmute yourself. Now, oh, sorry, I was reading that I am mute. <laughs> sorry. Um, so the context is someone, say, at Gateway is ready for a medical abortion, but there's no clinician. Ah. So, yeah, it would... Um, like, I suppose we could respond fairly quickly, but yeah, it'd be good yeah, yeah. to have a little bit of time because we ne would need to set up that link and everything. It'd just be the same way you do telehealth through health direct. Um, but if the referral was to uh, there's a process for that, and it's it's very straightforward, but it's we've got a different template than what a uh, the abortion and contraception service uh, referral um, template is. It just so really just highlights, highlights that it's a telehealth. So should we take that online maybe, Kath, and Ange, and you can work out a, a quick response, yeah, or anyone else who needs to have a quick response could, we can contact them in the next few days if they email you. About yeah. we'll set it up. For sure, just send me an email and we'll work it out, but it's very accessible. Yeah. Okay. We know how flexible Patty works. Yeah. Okay, but that you know, by all means, Ange, we're here to try and help for those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, so now, Kylie, that we've got through the um, we've got through all of the questions except what to do when the borders shut between New South Wales and Victoria, and I feel like my head's going to explode trying to think of that one. Um, there, but there was a comment in there. I think Harry just sent through a comment saying um, that it's unlikely, but we've just, there's just been so much rumour going mm. that we're, it's hard to get a straight answer at the moment from anyone. Um, and because other states have closed borders, it, yeah, it's just hard and I suppose we'll, I don't know, muddle through it if we, even when it happens. <laughs> so maybe we have to work on a bigger telehealth model then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm very aware that, um, uh, one eight hundred. My options. Carolyn's in her blue room, ready to talk. Sorry, we've taken so long on this. Carolyn, hello. Thanks for having me. Um, I won't take too long either. I just um, some of the things that we've been seeing here at one eight hundred are the um, extraordinary levels of panic that a lot of women have at the moment when they call us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So many conflicting messages they're getting around staying at home and what they can access. Uh, women are genuinely scared of going to hospitals and other health services. Women are also telling us that they're having a lot of trouble accessing ultrasound services. Mm. It's becoming significantly an issue for them. And another thing that hasn't been touched on today, and I don't know how relevant it is, it is for everyone in the group, but um, financial disadvantage is becoming huge women are losing their jobs and having to cancel appointments that they had for MTOC with service providers that were going to charge fees that they mm. can no longer afford. So that's been something that's yeah. come up in the last week quite significantly, that women are just not able to access the services that they otherwise thought they could. Um, and I guess another one is the telephony 
um, we are having some big challenges with the systems that we have in place. Telstra have told us that they are struggling with the demand on the phone and internet service. And so I think that's something to raise also if people are looking at providing more telehealth, whether the infrastructure can even cope with it. Mm, very interesting. Well, that's very sobering. I had I had heard a strange, strangely interacting with that comment recently that Netflix is decreasing its bandwidth because of the um, telemedicine requirements. Oh wow! Don't I know. Tell my Appar apparently, the premier has asked them to do that. That's well, what I heard. Yeah. That's what I heard. Mm. Yeah. Look, um, yeah, we're having we've it had a few more. that more people end up having sex. They can't oh, get their that's such an awful thought. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. There's going but to be I... an increase in unplanned pregnancy in our estimation and an increase in violence. Um, yeah, so true, Stephanie. Intimate yeah. partner violence. Um, and the things that Carolyn has just reported, we're starting to see at Children by Choice mm. as well, yeah. Carolyn. So yeah. and the subject of exactly the same conversations in a staff yeah. meeting today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, we are trying to manage uh, referrals across the system, but I think that there's going to be increased demand on the services that are low cost. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then there are women who are really scared to leave the house as well, and so they're really interested in the telehealth options, but whether that can actually be managed that well, I don't mm. know. Yeah. And uh, just on a day-to-day -day for you guys, are you all working, are you all phoning from home now? Is that what's yeah, happening? we're all remote now. Yeah. Um, the yeah. whole service has gone remote. So I guess that's why we've had a few little issues, but we are meeting the demand that we've got. Um, it's just not quite as responsive as we're used to being. The Telstra haven't been able to um, manage to fully divert the phone system. So we're returning calls at the moment. Well, that's great to hear that you're able to meet the demand. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I, had, yeah. I had heard that um, there was this delay because of the, the not able yeah. to relay. So there is a mild, minor delay, but we are actually managing to meet the demand pretty quickly. We're getting back to women. We've been able to um, have the staffing managed to yeah. meet the demand. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just aware of the time and I'm just thinking about all of the, anybody who mentioned a resource like Kathy, the RCOG guideline that others wouldn't have seen, anybody who has, and I've mentioned GP can, shall we all send them in and then we can put them on the minutes? Would that be useful or on the newsletter? Yes, yes. So um, we're recording tonight, so we'll get this up. Oh, goody. Yep. Yeah. Um, and also we've got, we've well, got a list there of all the resources so we can certainly um, compile them. And um, I was also going to suggest that we're more than happy to um, meet more regularly. For example, we've got an advisory, clinical advisory committee that kind of guides this network. If we want to meet more regularly or even as a, a broader group to problem solve and uh, please let us know because we'd be more than happy to facilitate that process um, through this be fantastic through this current forum. because we just yeah sorry sorry no yeah. go, go Kathy yeah oh I just think that would be fantastic you know just chatting through different things little issues come up that we can discuss that you, you don't sort of think of yourself so yeah that mm. would be really good yeah yeah and I'd agree too. yeah I'd like to be able to contribute to that as well so very happy to be involved with that and share any resources we've got sorry about the dog no, that's right. um, thanks well, Rhonda. Do, people, do people want to meet in a fortnight and we, you know we'll see where we are on the curve and you know yeah it'd be good for me yeah, yeah given the changes of day to day that yeah, yeah. Fortnight would be good. and well, is, this, is this a good time people a tuesday night from six to seven um yes yeah it's good for me so we could do that before Easter, which would be good. So that would be Tuesday, the 7th of April. Yeah. Thumbs up. Yep. Great. And we can spread the word at any, I mean, you know, like it, this initially started off as a, a network um, targeting rural practitioners because of their, 
the context of potentially being sole providers or isolated, but really it's for anyone <laughs> who is interested in this cur the, the current um, situation we find ourselves in. So when we do send out that information, please feel free to distribute it among other people that might be interested in joining the discussion. Um, and we could do a little bit of proactive engagement with some people like we've, um, I was thinking Patty and Kath and Nina, you know, we've recently chatted with Tasman some people in Tasmania, yeah. for example. We could encourage them to also uh, jump online and um, be part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. I've got colleagues in Queensland. Um, would you be interested in, in them joining as well? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, so I think I think as as Kylie said, it was originally for you know um, helping rural and remote. I think we're all feeling remote, aren't we? You know, we're all feeling remote from each other and a bit worried. And the patients are certainly feeling remote and you know at times uh, uncared for in this um, this time. So anything we can do. Um, and the, the only other thing I'd like to say is if, if people are happy to, if questions come up, as they come up, please to email and then we can um, and have them, I guess, ready to go or to think about or do some um, research. Or if people have got other resources that they want to contribute, we can have them ready for the meeting as well. We could, we could just, um, you know, I know it's time to finish, so we, we won't do the case study, but we could do the case study in a fortnight's time because it's actually a really good example of things we can defer in the time of COVID. You know, this is the patient who comes back with the ongoing bleeding and what's a good conservative management for that um, that doesn't involve an ultrasound, uh, another appointment and you know, plus or minus a D and C. So does that sound reasonable? I see some nods, yep, yep. Great. Carolyn, so, uh, it's Rhonda. Um, I just wanted to let you know, um, can you just let your clients know from, um, from MSA if they are struggling, if they've sort of had things and you know that they're um, dropping off because of their losing a job and that sort of thing. We do have, you know, we do have financial hardship that we're able to access at times. It is, yeah, it is becoming more difficult to access it, but um, just let them know that, um, you know, like we, we want to be able to provide services to them. So, um, that, you know, we're trying to look after people mm. before um, so much about the, the money so the side of things. Absolutely, Rhonda, absolutely. And we do let them know to explain their situation, especially with MSA, because we know that you do have that capacity. Right, but, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. I, one thing I would say that I have had reported back from a number of clients is that often they say, yes, they do have the capacity to pay and then they call us because they actually don't, but they're afraid that they won't have their appointment booked. Um, so I guess we just have to really, you know, check in about that when we are referring because I think people, as Patty rightly said, um, and others tonight, um, Carolyn in particular, are really afraid that they won't get access to services mm. particularly now in this environment so they you know might say things that yeah. just to you know yeah. secure appointments like, yeah, it's right. yeah. But it's like yeah. fever what fever yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes i did my self-assessment yeah. yeah yeah well done I just have a high color it's not a fever <laughs> yeah yeah Indeed. thank you um, so, Kylie, should we close and can we close with uh, a yet again another thank you to Search for organising this and um, I think we've got an agreement that we would be meeting again in two weeks. Fantastic. And I'd also like to uh, uh, express a big thank you to Nina Harkamis and yes, this is Nina. Nina's um, final week with Search as she moves on to expanding her own business and taking a role with Anglicare. And Nina has been a fantastic organiser of um, these network meetings and also the establishment of the resource hub. So all the best, Nina, for the future, and we will miss you. Thank you, Nina. Big thanks. Thank you, everyone. It's been great and uh, really great. And I hope to see many of you um, in another capacity one day soon. So all the best. And uh, yes, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll um, sign off now, everybody, and uh, stop the recording, and we'll see you in a fortnight. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Bye.